and thank you very much for joining us. Just a little bit of background about what brought us here today. This is a joint initiative of the Northwest Territories Association of Communities, Permanent Institute, and Ecology North. Uh, back in 2009, we hosted a climate change and communities conference. Um, some of you may have been in attendance at that. Um, there were a number of issues discussed, and since uh, 2009, the three organizations have been working together in order to address some of the priority uh, concerns that community members have raised and subsequent resolutions passed by the community members of the Northwest Territories Association of Communities. So I'm going to pass this over uh, to Steve Coquel. Thanks very much, Steve, for joining. And uh, I'll give you the reins. Hey, thanks. Thanks very much, Christine. Um, I'm a permafrost scientist with uh, the geoscience office here. Um, and uh, it's definitely my, my first experience uh, with a webinar. Uh, usually I can see my audience. Um, but uh, anyway, here goes. So what I've been asked to speak about today is, is some of the research that we've been doing in the, um, in the Western Arctic uh, and uh, northwestern part of the Northwest Territories. And although it doesn't pertain directly to built infrastructure, uh, I think some of the, the landscape uh, and environmental changes that we're seeing uh, really provide context for what we can expect to, to deal with um, as northerners and, um, and uh, as northern communities uh, as we deal with uh, climate change and climate variability in the future. So the part of the world that, uh, that I will have had the opportunity to work in uh, is the Mackenzie Delta region and the Peel Plateau. And so we'll, uh, we'll go there um, during this presentation. I'd like to acknowledge also the, the efforts of the Cumulative Impact Monitoring Program and also the, the numerous researchers that have been brought uh, in on this project and have played a big role in, I guess, um, providing the information that I'm able to put together today for, um, in this webinar. So in the next little, uh, little bit, we're going to talk a little bit about permafrost just to, in general, um, give you a sense of, of what in fact permafrost is and I'll try to, to put it into the context of, of not just the natural environment but the built environment. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the changes that we are seeing in permafrost conditions in the Northwest Territories and we'll then bridge into some of the research um, and the results that we've come up with. So I, I anticipate this will probably take uh, about 20 minutes or a half an hour um, to go through. So in the NWT, permafrost underlies the bulk of uh, the natural environment. In permafrost is, is classified or is actually is, is, is defined by temperature. So it, it refers simply to earth materials that are frozen for at least two years. And in permafrost terrain, uh, be it um, in, the, in, in the community or in the um, in the natural environment, there's a surface layer of soils that thaws and refreezes every year, and that's called the active layer. And the thickness of the active layer is a function of, of the uh, organic mat, uh, the amount of vegetation, uh, uh, the amount of organic layer thickness. So the, the, the soil properties affect how much thaw you have each year. And that refreezes and then thaws again the, the, the subsequent year. The active layer allows uh, plants to grow. Uh, it also really confines most of the uh, hydrological processes, so the movement of water from the landscape is, is in permafrost regions is largely confined to the, to the surface of the, uh, of the ground. In that sense, um, permafrost also, like the underlying permafrost, which the ground which stays frozen, it's, you kind of think of it as the glue that holds the landscape of the north together, and it's really fundamental to, um, to basically the functioning of, of northern ecosystems, but as you can imagine, it's also essential um, to provide stability to the built infrastructure that we have here in the north as well. So in the, uh, in the north, uh, one of the characteristics of permafrost is refers to the distribution, so how, what proportion of the landscape is underlain by permafrost. And in northern NWT, um, we, uh, we have almost the entire landscape that's underlain by, by frozen ground. And as we move south, uh, in association with warmer air temperatures, the proportion of the landscape that's underlain by permafrost decreases. And then eventually, as you get into the southern NWT, permafrost is only found sporadically in areas, particularly with, with organic soils. 
Another characteristic that defines permafrost is its thickness. In the north uh, of the NWT and in the Arctic Islands, permafrost can be almost a kilometer in thickness. As we move further south, the thickness of the permafrost, uh, so from the base of the active layer to some point beneath the ground, uh, the, the, the permafrost can be tens of meters thick and, and less and less until we get to southern NWT where permafrost may only be a few meters in thickness. Uh, you'll notice in this figure here, um, as we go from Tuktoyaktuk to Hay River, we have unfrozen zones underneath large bodies of water. Those are referred to as talics. So um, that's another characteristic of permafrost. So in an area where you have lots of lakes, uh, you can envision the sort of the three-dimensional configuration of permafrost as Swiss cheese with kind of holes underneath the lakes and frozen ground in, in, the, adjacent, uh, in the adjacent sediments. Again, we talked about the active layer, and the active layer is, again, it's that layer that thaws and refreezes every year. Now, it's, it's important because if we have a disturbance that could cause the active layer to deepen, such as a fire, or the removal of organic material because of uh, uh, the development of built infrastructure, that active layer will deepen and it'll start to thaw the, the top of permafrost. Depending on the amount of ice in the permafrost, uh, when we thaw the permafrost, the surface will, will likely subside. So if we have permafrost that's very ice poor, uh, active layer deepening will have little impact and little consequence on the land surface. However, if we have disturbed an area with ice-rich permafrost, the consequences are, can, be, can be significant. Uh, after forest fire, for example, uh, in the natural setting, we often have an increase in landslides, uh, we have surface subsidence, uh, the growth of, of fall lakes, uh, in the built environment, uh, we, we see the consequences of a deepening active layer uh, that results not necessarily from climate change, but just from the development of infrastructure through uh, the subsidence of the ground surface. Uh, anyone who uh, lives in any of our northern communities, or virtually um, all the northern communities, particularly north of Yellowknife, um, experiences um, the, the consequences of deepening an active layer and thawing of near surface permafrost as it manifests itself in the sort of the undulating road surfaces. So we have a kind of a continuous corridor of speed bumps that result from thawing of, of ice-rich permafrost. Um, the consequences are also significant with respect to the maintenance of, of your, your home, um, particularly if it's built on, on ice-rich ground. So permafrost is also defined by temperature. We can have ground that remains frozen that's very close to zero or ground that remains frozen that's that's quite cold. This figure here uh, on shows a, a, what we call a trumpet curve and it's a thermal profile in, in permafrost. We have on the left hand side um, we have a profile that shows the minimum temperatures of permafrost at a given site and then on the right the open diamonds show the maximum temperatures of permafrost. The area above the hash line at the surface is the active layer. So that's the, the surface soils that, that thaw seasonally. And what we can see is that the amplitude of variation, so the range of temperatures in the ground are very high in the near surface because the ground is responding to variation uh, with respect to air temperatures. And that amplitude of variation decreases with depth. And at some depth uh, below the ground surface, uh, we have no more permafrost. The thickness of permafrost is a function of the air temperature, it's a function of the, the thermal properties of the earth materials and the geothermal gradient, which is heat that's supplied from, from, from the center of the earth. And depending on the air temperatures and these, these other um, conditions, uh, you can have varying thickness of permafrost. So generally speaking, the colder the air temperature, the thicker the permafrost will be. We can think of it kind of as a I guess the geological manifestation of climate. Um, one of the, the, the aspects that, that affects the exchange of energy between the atmosphere and the ground surface is the buffer layer. Uh, and these are things such as vegetation cover, snow cover, the soil properties. And consequently, we can have a range of ground temperatures over an area of relatively, uh, over a relatively small area. And this becomes quite important uh, when we're thinking about the response of permafrost to climate change, uh, also when we're planning infrastructure in uh, over, over permafrost terrain. An example that I frequently draw upon is the range of permafrost conditions across tree line. These uh, slides show 
conditions north and south of tree line in the uh, in the Inuvik region. The southern photograph uh, shows the forest in Inuvik area. Uh, we have deep snow. We have very warm ground temperatures. And in the, the upper photograph shows the conditions around Tuktoyaktuk, where we have cold permafrost, very low snow cover. Now, the winter air temperatures or the mean annual air temperatures are almost the same uh, between Tuk and Inuvik. It's about a degree colder in Tuk. However, the permafrost temperatures are up to five degrees or six degrees colder in Tuk. And that's because in the winter time, a very low snow cover on the tundra promotes the extraction of heat from the ground. So the ground can cool off significantly in the winter time, uh, regardless of what the air temperatures are. And south of the tree line, you have a, a thick blanket of snow, which, which really prevents or inhibits heat loss. We can think about this in the context of our built infrastructure because there are natural conditions such as uh, steep embankments around roads that naturally accumulate snow. Uh, some people will bank snow around their house uh, in order to keep conditions under the house warmer, uh, keep basically keeping your floors warmer. Um, these might seem like logical things to do from a, an energy efficiency perspective, but you, you're inadvertently um, creating a situation where you could be thawing the permafrost underneath your house, uh, which will cause a different set of, of challenges for you. So, um, of course, the answer is not simple, but we can learn a lot from what we see in the natural environment uh, that can help us um, you know, figure out how to behave and, um, I guess, preserve the permafrost in our communities as best we can. Uh, this figure here just shows the range of ground temperatures in the Mackenzie Delta region. It's sort of a summary of the discussion that we've just had where we have very cold ground temperatures in Tuck, very warm ground temperatures around Inuvik, just below zero. And again, that's largely a function of vegetation and snow cover rather than, uh, rather than climate. So the, we've talked uh, now about the distribution of permafrost, the thickness of permafrost, the temperatures of permafrost, all of which can vary uh, depending on, on your location. Uh, but permafrost derives its, its environmental significance from the presence or absence of ice in the ground. So you could have permafrost in bedrock or in sandy dry soils. It really is just referring to the, the, the temperature conditions of the ground. If that permafrost were to thaw, so uh, we live here in Yellowknife and uh, you could have permafrost in bedrock. If that permafrost were to thaw, it would, there would be very little consequences in terms of the stability of the, of the landscape. However, as you can see in some of these, uh, some of these photographs from the Western Arctic, permafrost can have significant amounts of ice in it. And if that permafrost thaws, of course, the consequences to the environment are, are quite substantial. Now, one of the questions that people have uh, regarding permafrost, and it's, it's definitely a focus of our, our studies, it, it pertains to the impact that climate warming may have on, on permafrost. And um, we in the Northwest Territories are in an area where the climate has warmed substantially uh, over the last uh, several decades. This is a figure, it's a little bit dated, but essentially the trend is, is very similar if we added the last 10 years of data. Now we can see that the, uh, the, the mean um, or the amount of, of climate warming over the last uh, 50 years has been most substantial throughout Canada in the, in the Western Arctic and the Northwest Territories. So as a permafrost scientist, as I mentioned earlier, um, I referred to permafrost as a geological manifestation of climate. It stands to reason that as the climate warms, the permafrost will, will also warm. Of course, there are a number of things that, that sort of complicate that story. Um, and one of those is sort of the absence of long-term data on permafrost temperatures. But, but we're fortunate in the, in the Northwest Territories to have um, some of the work that was conducted by uh, the Geological Survey, as well as uh, Dr. Mackay, uh, who is a professor at the University of, uh, of British Columbia. And he had an extensive network of ground temperature data collection in the Mackenzie Delta region. And that's shown in this figure here uh, from the 1970s. We have permafrost temperatures in the Mackenzie Delta region. And we were able to revisit many of these sites over the last decade. And clearly we see that uh, permafrost has warmed by anywhere from a degree to two degrees uh, in this region over the last 30 years. So indeed, permafrost has responded to, uh, uh, to, to, to the warming air temperatures uh, throughout, throughout this region. Now, one of the, I guess to take this a step further, um, we want to understand 
how these changes in ground temperatures have, have impacted the landscape. And because the Western Arctic, uh, much of it is underlain by very, very ice-rich permafrost, and that would extend into many parts of the Mackenzie Valley. Um, this is a, 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 actually a great, a great uh, environment to, to study this question. Uh, some of the work that I'm going to present now focuses on uh, work in the Peel Plateau, which is a, it's basically a strip of land that uh, extends from the Beaufort Sea coast right down into uh, um, throughout central Northwest Territories. It's, it occurs on the eastern slopes of the Mackenzie Mountains and the Richardson Mountains. It occupies about 30 to 40,000 square kilometers, and it consists of, of uh, materials that have really, really high amounts of ice in them. Um, community members in Fort McPherson have noticed some significant changes in the, to the landscape in that area and are, have drawn our attention to some of these changes. So the work that I'm going to present uh, focuses on understanding what some of these changes are from a community perspective but also from a scientific perspective, trying to understand what some of the drivers of these changes are and how they have affected the landscape in, uh, in this part of the world. There's other work that some of the researchers involved in the program are undertaking that focuses more on um, the biological impacts of these changes. I'm not going to focus on that in this talk, but if, if people have questions about it, i um, be glad to direct you to, um, to the work of, of those individuals, and I could answer some of the questions as well. So the work is uh, it takes place um, in the Peel Plateau. I talked a little bit about that area. It's indicated in the map on the left-hand side of this figure. It's a big landscape, very beautiful, beautiful area. And um, we're, we're fortunate in, in some respects to have a, a transportation corridor that runs through this, this landscape, and that allows us to access, allow, access these sites relatively easily. It also, I think, raises the relevance of the work um, from the perspective of um, the impacts of landscape change on built infrastructure. So the Dempster Highway runs right through the, the Peel Plateau. Uh, in the, the map on the, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, all of the black stars uh, indicate thaw slumps, which are those large uh, uh, landslide-type features that were shown on the previous slide. I'll talk a little bit more about, about those in this presentation. And the red dots in the map indicate landslides that are of unprecedented size. So again, what has drawn attention to this, to, to this part of the world um, from the scientific community is the fact that a lot of these slumps and landslides that are occurring are occurring at a scale that's beyond what we've what we've seen before. So a thaw slump is a, kind of a common slope disturbance that occurs in areas where there's lots of ice in the ground, uh, in, in permafrost areas. And in a way, I've, I've in this slide I kind of liken the life cycle of a slump to that of a human. Um, in they have uh, they're initiated usually by erosion uh, at the base of a slope. So it could be a small stream, it could be a coastline. Uh, and they, it's, they sort of start from humble beginnings. They start very small. And then as ground ice is exposed to, uh, to, to the sun, to solar input, um, the, the, the ground ice thaws. And uh, it kind of chews its way up slope. And as it chews its way up slope, um, I, we call that the active stage or the youthful stage of a slump. Uh, the slumps can grow tens, hundreds, and now what we're seeing is up to, you know, over a kilometer up slope. Um, there's a large head wall which exposes the, the ground ice in the permafrost that's being, uh, that's being thawed. And then eventually, at least what has happened in the past, is that these slumps stabilize. Materials accumulate, uh, uh, they insulate the, the exposed ice, and the slump, uh, the slump uh, becomes sort of a relic feature on the landscape. Uh, what we're seeing today uh, in the Peel Plateau is an is a acceleration in the rates of slumping and also the size. So consequently, we have these huge features on the landscape. And uh, of course, the people in Fort McPherson, uh, the Tetlik Witch Inn, and, and other people in the region are concerned at what these types of disturbances, uh, the impacts of them on the, on the landscape. So this is a, the headwall of a thaw slump. And you can see there's almost 100 feet of permafrost exposed here. Most of it is uh, is very very um, icy ground. It's it's almost all ground ice. Um, it's absolutely a, just a, a huge huge um, exposure. And this is there's many of these in the in the Peel Plateau. Um, 
the other characteristics that are associated with these landslides is uh, our, our huge debris flows. So in this slide, we have uh, an example of some of the debris flows that have developed below the fossil homes. They've infilled entire stream valleys and extended for kilometers down, down valley. Um, these are streams that would have uh, formerly, formerly been used by some land users as uh, for, for trapping or to access trap lines. Uh, and at least in the summertime, they're completely impassable. And they're actually quite dangerous. Um, because of the uh, because the, the materials just can't they can't be walked on. Just to put this into perspective, at least for the folks um, who are familiar with Yellowknife, um, we I just took the the slides or the the outline of the, the slump that we were looking at and superimposed it over Yellowknife, and as you can see, it covers most of downtown Yellowknife and extends right down into into the old town. So. Um, in some of the smaller communities, uh, a feature like this, you could kind of can put the entire community into one of these features, which are several kilometers in length. And so when we've started to do this mapping, we find that there are hundreds of these throughout the Peel Plateau. Um, another unique aspect of these disturbances is that unlike a, a landslide that might occur in the southern, in southern um, regions, landslides tend to happen abruptly. So they're, they, they occur right away and then they stabilize. But a slump can grow and it can continue to grow for many, many decades. So in the 50s, this one slump was initiated and uh, it's continued to grow throughout the 1970s and to present day, uh, the slump now occupies almost a whole entire square kilometer. So this has prompted a bunch of research questions. Uh, we want to understand the environmental impacts of these disturbances. We want to know, are they in fact increasing? Uh, or have these have these things always been there? We just haven't been looking. Um, and uh, we want to understand what the feedbacks are that promote the perpetuation of these features. So why are they not? Why are these things not healing? Why does the land? Why do they continue to grow? And then what are some of the? Uh, I guess the. What are the different landscapes that could potentially be affected by this type of of, of process? So one of the the most dramatic impacts that these disturbances have uh, are on the water quality of streams. So, uh, many of the tundra streams in this region can be <laughs> relatively clear water streams. When a slump occurs, it delivers huge amounts of sediment from the slopes into the, into the stream valley. It increases the, the amount of suspended sediment in the streams, which is essentially it's the amount of mud um, being carried by the, by the stream. And it also affects the chemistry of the streams because in the permafrost, we have a lot of soils that have not previously been exposed to weathering. Um, so they, they chemically and mechanically have not been broken down because they've been, they've been frozen. Once these uh, materials are thawed, uh, they, can, uh, they can be leached and we have usually very, very high concentrations of all sorts of different dissolved materials that are, are washed into the streams. So there's, there's a very distinct uh, chemical signature from runoff uh, from these disturbances. They also affect the timing of, of sediment input into the streams. So normally um, what would happen is that if we're in an environment where there's, there's, there's a lot of sediment available to make it from the slopes into the streams, that sediment would be transferred during, um, during things like rainfall events. And we can see in this, this figure here, which see, has a lot of lines on it, but I'll, I can explain it fairly simply. Um, we have uh, time on the, uh, on the x-axis, so on the bottom axis, uh, it represents uh, summer of 2010. So from uh, um, June 2010 through to July 2010. And the top graph uh, shows a blue trace with some big spikes in it. And that represents the water levels in a typical stream uh, in the Peel Plateau. And the spikes are the result of rainfall events. So it rains, the water goes up quickly. Water is transferred from the landscape to the streams very quickly in this environment because we have it's underlain by permafrost, so the water can't soak into the ground too much, and it causes the stream levels to go up. And then, of course, after the rain falls, the water levels go back down. Now, in the lower part of the graph, we have uh, it, it indicates turbidity in the streams, and that's essentially the amount of, of sediment in the stream, so an indicator of how muddy the water is. And the blue trace. Uh, which has really, really steep peaks, and, and that indicates uh, the amount of 
turbidity in streams that are that are undisturbed. And we can see that the peaks are associated with rainfall events. So it rains, sediment is washed into the stream, and then the water levels go down and the stream clears right back up. So these are kind of clear water streams that one would expect to catch grayling in or, or, or trout if they were there. And then above that, we can see the black lines, which are which have really high turbidity levels, but they fluctuate wildly. And um, this uh, is the, the turbidity levels in these streams that are affected by thaw slumps. And the reason that we have variation that is that great, and those are daily spikes, is that uh, the streams are actually starting to behave like glacial streams. There's so much ice melt in these large thaw slumps that uh, in the at nighttime ice melt is relatively low and there's a small amount of, of mud going into the uh, into the streams and then in the daytime when the sun comes out it starts to melt the ground ice and it delivers a whole bunch of sediment into these streams uh, and it increases the amount of, of uh, the, the turbidity levels. So these streams are behaving now in ways that we just haven't seen streams behave in, in the past. As I mentioned earlier uh, the chemistry of streams is also affected by by the degradation of permafrost and we wanted to see whether or not an acceleration in the amount of slumping has affected the water quality of the Peel River. We were able to do this by taking a long-term water quality data uh, record from Environment Canada that Environment Canada has collected uh, at Fort McPherson. And we can see that the sulfate levels uh, have increased substantially over the last 40 years in the Peel River and sulfate is one of the main dissolved materials that leaches out of, of, uh, of thawing permafrost. So again, there's enough change in the watershed of the Peel River, which drains an area of about 70,000 square kilometers, to actually impact significantly the water quality of this river. We're also able to look at archived uh, satellite imagery, uh, sort of to go back through time and to see whether in fact there has been a huge change in the landscape. And of course, one of the first places that we've, we've collected this information was from the folks in the community who, who definitely have, have a perception that there's been significant changes. And that's confirmed through uh, remote sensing imagery. Uh, so here we have an image from 1985, and then we have an image from 2011. And we can see all of those blue uh, areas that are circled are thaw slumps that have developed since uh, the 1985, since the, since the 80s. And these are huge features. Those are, some of those are over uh, are several, several kilometers in length. Um, this is repeated over and over again as we look at different study areas in the, in the Peel Plateau, and it's summarized in this figure. So we have a size of slumps uh, on the x-axis of this figure, and then the relative proportion of, uh, of slumps that fall into the different size categories. And we can see in the 1980s, indicated by the red bars, that most of the slumps in this part of the world were between 0 and 5 hectares, so they were relatively small. And very, there were very few larger slumps, which indicated slump would initiate, and then by the time it got to about five hectares, it would usually stabilize. What we see in the size distribution from 2011, indicated by the blue bars, uh, first off, is that there are many more slumps in present day than there were in the 1980s. But not only that, um, the tail of that of that distribution extends far off to the right-hand part of the of the graph, which tells us that. Uh, there are many more large slumps now on the landscape. And this is an indicator that slumps that were initiating and used to stabilize now just continue to grow. Um, so in fact, um, the landscape is changing and it's changing quite substantially. So this is a, a video that I'm going to show uh, here that uh, illustrates some of the Try to get it going here. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a video that shows some of the activity of the of a, a large slump right near the uh, the Dempster Highway. That slump that we were just looking at is about a kilometer in diameter. Uh, this figure here, or this part of the the, the video, shows the headwall uh, of the thaw slump in the background. So that headwall is about 30, 25 to 30 meters high. And as the ground ice ablates, you can see the spruce trees falling, falling down and the materials in the foreground being removed. Um, now this here uh, in the, it shows the, the debris flow and it's moving materials away from the slump. Every time it gets dark, that illustrates one, one day. So you can just envision that we have a conveyor belt of materials that's just continually 
moving hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cubic meters of, uh, of debris away from the slump to the valley below. Some of those chunks of material that are moving down are the size of sort of pickup trucks. So it's a massive amount of material. And I'd mention that there's also many, many of these features throughout the Peel Plateau. What we wanted to do is we wanted to turn this photographic data into some sort of data set that we could look at and compare to, uh, to climate data to try to figure out what are factors that accelerate the, the, you know, the activity of these features. And so what we did is we developed a, an index, which is an index of the amount of materials that are moving down uh, away from the slump frame by frame. And the sediment transport index that we derived is a calculation that uh, gives us the relative movement downslope multiplied by the width of the movement and whether or not there's actually surface lowering in each frame. And it's illustrated in this, in this figure here, the blue trace uh, indicates the sediment transport index. And you can see it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. It follows the same pattern, that daily pattern of ground ice melt. Uh, so the sun comes out, melts ground ice, and you have a pulse of materials that go down slope. And it lags behind solar radiation, um, which is kind of exactly what we'd expect. So intuitively, we would think when we have hot, dry weather, these slumps would, or hot weather, these slumps would grow. And, and this, this uh, data here is from one of the hottest periods in 2010. But when we look at the data over the entire summer, which is indicated in this in this figure here, um, the part the graph that I previously showed you uh, is is indicated in this red box on the left hand side of the of the graph, and the amount of movement during the hot period of the summer is actually very very small relative to the amount of movement after uh, intense rainfalls, and so what this has caused us to um, to conclude is. That that rainfall is really a primary driver of, of, of the movement of materials away from the, uh, the, the headwall of the slump. So if we accumulate materials in the headwall uh, the, or, or in the scar zone, the uh, ground ice will become insulated and the slump will stabilize. However, if we remove materials, which is what's happening when we have intense rainfall events, we're essentially resetting the slump and allowing it to continue to grow up slope. It, we're taking it farther away from the point of it healing itself. Uh, it's also illustrated in this uh, in this time series from 2012, where we measured a record rainfall in the Peel Plateau. We we measured over 100 millimeters of rain in four hours, um, so that's extremely intense rain. Uh, we had a hot, dry summer, and then we had the ex extreme rainfall event. And you can see when we flip flop between these two photos, all the materials that were accumulating in the slump scar zone after the rainfall event have been pushed down slope. Um, and this again, essentially allowing that slump to continue to grow upslope um, for for a much longer period of time. So the key message here is that if we have cool and dry weather or warm and dry weather, we're much more likely to stabilize slopes in in these ice rich environments. However, when we have wet and warm weather, those are the conditions that we see presently, and they are resulting in the evolution of these huge disturbances. Um, so an, an, I guess another initiative um, that I'm just going to touch on here before we wrap up is the, the question, of course, that you might be asking is, well, does this type of process, will it affect my community? Will it affect the area where I live? And the answer um, is not necessarily. Um, but one of the ways that we get at that is by being able to map the distribution of these disturbances at a very large scale. And one thing that's inhibited that is that we've never had good enough imagery or mapping or maps um, to be able to map at a, at a really broad scale. Uh, so in the past, people have done this kind of work, but they've done it in sort of postage stamp style. So they've gone to a particular area where they have some interests and they've, they've done the mapping. Um, the Center for Geomatics, uh, the GMWT Spatial Warehouse, which is a site that you can go to online, um, it, it, it allows you to actually access the map that I'm showing you right here. And it's a mosaic of spot imagery. And spot imagery is satellite imagery that has a resolution of five meter uh, pixel size. So you can zoom right in. You can't see necessarily buildings, but you can very, very effectively map slope disturbances. And what we did was we gridded the entire north of Canada. And we had summer students, uh, as well as uh, some graduate students, classify all of these grid cells, uh, determining whether or not there are thaw slumps in those 
grid cells and what type of environment they were associated with. And so the mappers would zoom in, and this is the type of imagery you'd be able to see. This is part of Banks Island, and we can see that uh, many of the river valleys here are affected by slumping. So they would classify that grid cell as being impacted by slumping. They would classify it to be highly impacted, and the, they would indicate that streams uh, are the type of, or valleys are, and streams are, are being impacted by these disturbances. And when we, when we step away, and we actually look at the parts of the NWT that are being impacted, those are indicated on this on this map here in in yellow. And when we look at this pattern, it actually coincides very, very closely with the extent or the maximum extent of the Laurentide ice sheet. So that 10,000 years ago or 15,000 years ago, um, much of the Northwest Territories was was um, overlain by, by a glacier. Um, and one of um, what we're seeing is that the pattern of where these slumps occur are very close to the margins of that of that glacier or subsequent readvances of the glacier, uh, which are marked by morainal systems. Um, so the, the and a morainal system is basically a, a, a deposit that results by from the kind of the bulldozing of materials by a glacier. Um, we can see those small moraines um, in in mountain glaciers, like at the snout of a mountain glacier. Now, if we can envision um, what would have what would have been happening here 15,000 years ago, we would have had a huge glacier that was sort of excavating and bulldozing materials. And as that glacier retreated, the materials that were, were covering the snout of the glacier would have um, basically created a kind of a, a it would have been like leaving having a dirty snowbank left um, after the winter time. And you, many of you are probably familiar with seeing sort of dirty snow snow banks that take a long time to melt. Uh, along roadsides or in parking lots. And that's very similar, I think, to what had happened here. Now, in southern Canada, the same thing would have occurred or southern North America, and you would have had huge changes to the landscape 13,000 years ago as the climate warmed and, these, and this ice would have melted out. However, in, in the Northwest Territories, uh, as the glacier retreated, the climate remained still relatively cool uh, permafrost degraded and essentially preserved a lot of that ice in the ground. Um, so if we think about these landscapes in, in the context of, of the legacy of what happened in the past, um, it really puts into perspective the potential for change to these landscapes in the future, particularly if we think about them as landscapes that haven't yet completely undergone deglaciation. So in an, in, from a, the perspective of climate change, I would say that the, the the potential for change in these environments is, is huge. So to wrap up, um, permafrost in the NWT has warmed in response to climate change. That's There's a lot of evidence for that, um, and we could talk about that later. Um, the thawing of ice-rich permafrost is certainly causing landscape changes, but I think a, a clear message is that some landscapes are more susceptible to change to others, and that has to do with not only how much ice there is in the ground, but it has to do with sort of the history of the landscape and understanding that uh, I think can give us a, a really good clue into the future in terms of how these landscapes will, will, will change. And of course, our communities throughout the territories and our infrastructure is peppered across all sorts of different types of landscapes. So I guess the key message there is not all landscapes are created equal and the susceptibility to change is gonna, is gonna vary or it does vary. Um, there's major changes that are resulting um, as a result, uh, they're, they're consequent from thawing permafrost, and we've been able to show that they can influence the behavior of streams and rivers. The impacts are widespread now, and we can detect those changes um, in the chemistry of large rivers. And we would say certainly warmer, but also wetter conditions will accelerate the degradation of, of ice rich landscapes. So we tend to always think about climate change from the perspective of, of temperature, um, but I think a really, really important um, sort of change and, and, and factor that we're going to have to deal with in the north uh, also relates to wetter conditions, um, having to deal with, with water and the consequences that um, more water will have or wetter conditions will have or more extreme events will have on, uh, on the landscape and our infrastructure. And then just to sort of tie this um, out, uh, I would say that knowledge of the permafrost environment and the response to climate change of these different environments will certainly inform infrastructure planning and also mitigation measures. So we can, um, we can talk.
talk about some of that now, um, if you'd like. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, that was a great, very interesting presentation. I have a question for Steve. You were saying these big pieces of materials are being moved by rain. Are those like pieces of ice or is that non-ice? No, it's non it's non-ice. So the picture that we're looking at, Christy, is you can see like kind of, um, you can sort of see the head wall of the slump. That's all ice. And as that ice thaws, it basically falls down to the base of the slump. It also, some of it consists of, you know, trees and stuff that are, you know, on the original ground surface. And it just kind of creates this mud slurry. Um, and that just, in, I guess for a non-scientific term, just kind of oozes down the slope and, uh, and and makes its way into the into the stream valleys. And then the actual stream, just depending on what the water levels are like, picks that stuff up. But but when we look at streams like above and below these disturbances, they're they're just so remarkably different. Um, you know, upstream they they tend to be relatively clear water, and downstream they're. I think I had a picture earlier in the presentation. Um, it's you know it's it's just absolutely full of sediment. So there's you know there can be grams per liter of sediment. I don't know if that means anything to you, but. Um, it's really, really muddy water. You, you would not, never even contemplate drinking it. You probably couldn't filter it because it would just clog your filter up. I had a question, Steve, when I saw that last map that you put on with the yellow um, disturbance zones. And uh, I guess I was curious to sort of see that overlaid with a map of where the communities are and potentially also the watersheds that they're feeding into. So I'm curious about how far downstream uh, you think that this is going to impact, have impacts, the additional sediment flows. So how many communities might actually be affected? Are there communities that where their drinking water could be affected, for example, at this point? Or is that something that you project maybe in the future with ongoing climate change? Okay. Um, well, I guess two things. One, the, the mapping initiative that I presented on is, we're st I'm still sort of reviewing all the data. So the map that I created there essentially it's a kind of a it's, an, it's not a final product it's a kind of a representation of the data as we as it's coming in but uh, ballpark it's it's going to be it's pretty accurate um, one of the things that we want to do once that is is real data is is address the questions that you that you have we can overlay watersheds um, mm -hmm. and we can look at downstream effects certainly in the case of the peel um, the Peel River, uh, only about 30% of the watershed actually drains these types of landscapes that are impacted by thaw slumps, but it had, but they have a they can have a disproportionately large effect on the the water quality in, in these rivers. Like so, the Peel is a good example where it picks up. Uh, you know, folks from McPherson will tell you this. It picks up the bulk of its sediment. Um, not in the mountains, but once it actually enters through what we call the Peel Plateau. Uh, and then, of course, um, once the materials are, are entrained in a big river like the Peel, they'll, that'll continue. So it'll, it'll likely, um, you know, I, or certainly the, the, the possibility is that it's going to impact conditions downstream. Um, similarly, the, the streams that drain the Mackenzie Mountains, like the Keel, the, the Redstone, like a lot of these tri tributaries of the Mackenzie, are going to be affected, um, and I guess really it sort of remains to be seen in terms of how the Mackenzie responds. It's a bigger river, but we've looked at, or uh, Water Resources Division uh, with ANSI has actually looked at some of the geochemical trends in the in the Mackenzie at Sigachik, for example, and there's already indicate the similar indications in terms of geochemical trends are observed in the Mackenzie as well. Um, so it may, it's probably a little bit premature to conclude that it's the result of this same process, but it seems to point in that direction. Um, once we have this, once we have the watersheds delineated and overlain with, with the, the data that, um, that I was just discussing, then we can kind of think, have a, a much better handle on, on the, you know, the communities that would be directly, um, directly affected. Now, Fort McPherson, for example, um, like, 
I guess one of the things that you should, pro should probably point out is that these landscapes, they've they've always had these types of processes impacting them. There's certainly what we're seeing now is an acceleration, but the streams in the Peel Plateau have always, some of them have always been, you know, have had a lot of sediment in them. They weren't traditionally areas where people would grab water from. So, uh, for example, the Tetlik uh, or the McPherson people, Tetlik, which and they would draw water from James Creek, uh, which is up in the mountains on the other side of sort of the Peel Plateau, and then the community itself draws water from the east side of the Mackenzie River, which is outside of the Peel Plateau again. So, I mean, um, you know, it could. It, I suspect it's going to matter in in general in a general sense, um, but I think the communities um, have kind of set themselves up in ways where they're 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 trying to obtain water. They have obtained water from from sources that are more secure. Quick announcement here, uh, an event that's coming up. We have Brian Steven actually here. He's listed as a panelist. He's going to be presenting during the second webinar series, uh, but welcome, Brian. And this is uh, Brian's initiative that he's opening, uh, that he's hosting and organizing. Um, so here it is on the screen. Um, this is coming up in November 2013, and there's um, a web link there up top. So just something to put on your radar is that this conference is coming up. And um, as I understand it, uh, a real focus on on linking sort of the knowledge, the current knowledge to community issues. Brian, did did you want to speak to that at all? Also, uh, the, noting here that we are encouraging people also in, in communities who can't make it to Yellowknife and people from southern Canada to uh, watch remotely as we're webcasting the whole workshop. Okay, that's neat. That's great. Thank you. So thanks everyone for coming today. Um, and stay tuned for the next um, session going to be held at some time in October and, and we'll disseminate that information. So thanks very much and um, take care, enjoy the afternoon. <laughs>